Thanks for staying with us. Egypt has executed Isham Ashmawi, a man one considered the country's most wanted jihadist. The country's state-owned Now News TV channel and Egypt's military spokesman said he was killed on Wednesday morning. Isham Ashmawi wants an army officer was found guilty of involvement in several high-profile attacks, including one in Western Egypt in 2014 that killed several security personnel. He was also convicted of being behind a 2013 attempt to assassinate then Interior Minister Mohamed Ibrahim. Ashmawi was captured in eastern Libya last year by forces loyal to Commander Khalifa Haftar. The Cameroonian army has denied reports in local media that nine soldiers have been arrested in connection with a military operation last month in which more than 20 civilians were allegedly killed. Defence officials initially said five civilians died after being accidentally caught in crossfire between the military and separatist rebels in the western village of Garaba. However, human rights groups said Cameroonian soldiers and armed ethnic Fulani went from house to house shooting dead the residents, including 13 children. President Paul Bia ordered an investigation into the incident after several countries, including the United States and France, condemned the killings. Several Cameroonian soldiers are still on trial, accused of executing two women and their two young children in 2015. Violence has forced thousands of people to flee their homes in South Sudan's Jongle State, an area which has suffered repeated communal clashes. The medical charity Médecins Sans Frontières says it is treating victims of gunshot wounds who have walked through the night to reach Paibo Town, where 5,000 people are seeking shelter. It says thousands more who fled into the bush are unable to get medical help. Last month, South Sudan's political rivals signed a power-sharing deal in the hope of providing a lasting solution to five years of civil war. To politics now, Togo's president, Fona Simbe, has won re-election with 71% of the vote, extending his 15-year-old rule and a family dynasty that began when his father took power in a 1967 coup. Despite widespread disaffection and protests calling for him to step down, a fractured opposition struggled to launch a concerted campaign to unseat President Nasimbe in the small West African country of 8 million people. His closest rival, former Prime Minister Gabriel Kojo, won 19% of the vote in the contest last month, and with longtime opposition leader Jean-Pierre Fabre getting 5%, according to latest results. The head of the court says the proclamation is final and closes the debate on the presidential election of February the 22nd. A dozen soldiers have occupied the grounds of Guinea-Bissau Supreme Court deep in a post-election crisis that has resulted in the appointment of rival presidents and the silencing of state media. The West African country's military, which has regularly intervened in politics in recent decades, vowed to remain neutral ahead of the uh, December election, but the presence last week of senior army officials at the inauguration of Umaro Sikusoko Mbalo as president appeared to signal it had picked a side. The Electoral Commission has repeatedly confirmed Mbalo as the winner of the December 29 runoff, despite complaints by the Supreme Court and the declared runner-up that the Commission had not respected the court's orders to conduct a full audit of the vote. On Monday, soldiers occupied the Supreme Court grounds in Bissau, the capital, blocking entry to judges and officials. Now, Grasa Michelle, widow of South Africa's former president, Nelson Mandela, is on the cover of this month's Forbes Africa as the magazine prepares to announce its list of the continent's 50 most powerful women. A prominent child rights campaigner, the 74-year-old was also once married to Samora Michelle, the first president of Mozambique. The magazine's editor also tweeted the cover of Forbes Africa Women, which it 
says features those on the list described as Africa's most influential and impactful seed crashes, movers and shakers. Ugandan Winnie Biyamima, who is head of UNAID, South African television presenter, Bonang Matiba, Cameroonian entrepreneur, Rebecca Nchohong, and South African businesswoman, Irene Chanley, are all photographed dressed in red. Well, old wine in New Can, South African startup sniffs new export opportunity. A South African startup is hoping to cash in on a growing global taste for canned wines as a lighter, more convenient alternative to bottles. Take a look. It's an innovation that could make wine purists shudder, but a South African startup is hoping to cash in on a rising global trend amongst millennials for canned wines. <laughs> and can it tins of premium red and white wines are the first to be certified by South Africa's Wine and Spirit Board and are also vegan friendly. It's the same quality and it's just more convenient to carry around also and it's quite enjoyable to drink from a can. The launch is initially targeting a domestic audience before the owner, Arnold Vlok, takes a crack at the lucrative export market. We're very close to exporting to the US uh, where this market is well established and I think the European market is especially responsive to our, um, the benefits that we add on our product which is no sulfur added and vegan friendly. Um, that together with the eco-friendliness of, of packaging in a can which far lowers your, your carbon footprint of the consumer. South Africa produced more than 820 million litres of wine in 2018, making it one of the top global producers. But wine taster Saret van der Hever says there's room for uncanny. I think if you, um, if you serve the wine out of a glass bottle um, and you pour it into a glass, it will, definitely, it will definitely taste different than if you serve it and you maybe drink it out of the can, absolutely. But the core thing is, you're not trying to replace, I think, existing wines that's made in a specific way and that's served in a specific way. Uncanny sells its 250 millimeter aluminium can for around 40 rand or under 3 US dollars. Still on celebrating powerful women, when Tene Konate split from her husband in 2011, she struggled to earn enough to feed the two children she was looking after alone. Then she landed an opportunity that transformed her life, a job driving a 72-ton dump truck at a gold mine in Burkina Faso. Now Konate and a few dozen others have formed a vanguard of women workers overturning long-held traditions in a male-dominated industry. Industry. That is just a few of stories we look forward to as we head to Women's Day. And that's the program today. Thank you so much for watching and Tenyola Shabuali. Bye for now.